Hello and welcome again. Um, we are so happy you joined us today for this webinar from an Access Foundation, Access to Energy Institute and Okra Solar. We will today talk uh, about CICADA, the open source IoT communication model, which was created for energy access organizations. Um, we will be going uh, through this agenda today. We will have a short introduction about the three people on stage, which you can already see here. Um, then we will have a short intro about what the CICADA IO2 module actually is and what it can uh, and some of its technical specs and what it has been built for. And then we want to engage in an interesting discussion between us and Access as an initial supporter and funder of the module, then Okra Solar as the initial developer, which developed it for their own needs, and A2EI as an organization currently looking into adapting and adopting the module and for which reasons and what potential they see and what challenges they see. Um, then after roughly 25 minutes or half an hour, we will get a live demo by Georg to see how to get started with Cicada when you want to use it. And after that, we will open the stage for questions. The questions will be posted during the whole webinar in the chat. So just write them down whenever you have a question and we will make sure to cover as many as we can of those questions in the Q&A session at the end. So let's get started. Um, me, myself, I am Vivian Barnier, the Chief Operating Officer of the NXS Foundation. NXS Foundation is a Dutch nonprofit which engages in su identifying, supporting and promoting open source innovations for the energy access sector. And uh, what does that mean in detail? So we reach out to the sector or the real sector reach out to us with particular challenges that they have, which can be technology, software, hardware, but also concepts, uh, business models, um, and engage with us in a discussion if this is a solution that is possibly not only necessary for them, but can as actually be leveraged and used by the whole sector. And we then co-design and agree on a, on a shape and scope of the development that can actually be useful to more organizations and in best case to all organizations in the sector, but to as many organizations as possible. Um, and that's also how we ended up in supporting the development of the CICADA IoT modules because uh, we pretty much believed in the potential of these modules to be open source for the sector so that anybody in the sector can take them and treat them uh, we do this because we want the energy access organization to focus on their core business and not spend their scare resources and uh, time on reinventing the wheel and just developing baseline infrastructure which is required and needed but which is needed by much more organizations in the sector and which does not make them outstanding in terms of their operating model or their technology from the others so that they can actually focus on developing their outstanding IP value um developments but the baseline infrastructure should be open source and shared so that we can all profit in the sector and i do this personally because i come from a private sector and i have seen these happening quite often and quite a lot uh, in the sector in by private companies just spending their resources in just doing things that have already been done and have already been developed instead of being able to actually leverage on on the wisdom on the crowd so that's what uh, an access does and why I'm motivated about open source innovations for the energy access sector. And I will hand over to Rainier from Kappenhaut from HOEI to introduce himself. Thanks very much, uh, Vivian, for the introduction and uh, thanks for having me here today. My name is René van Kampenhout from the Access to Energy Institute. We are uh, also active in the energy access domain. We are located in Berlin, Germany, and we have two main pillars. One is Prospect, that's an open source data platform for the 
whole energy access sector, collects data flows from on-grid, mini-grid, off-grid sources, and allows the users to process, customize, and visualize this data. And the second uh, project is what we'll be talking about today, the SKGS, or Solar Generator Project. It's aimed at uh, designing and producing solar systems in a range of about two to three kilowatts for small businesses. And the system consists of panels, batteries, inverter, and our, our MCU, which is essentially monitoring device that collects data, transfers it to our backend. Here, uh, next to me, you can see one of our uh, inverters, recognizable by the pink color. And the systems are dimensioned so that it ca they can replace petrol and diesel generators that are used to respond to uh, grid blackouts. Countries such as Nigeria, South Africa, and H Honduras are experiencing. And we see that uh, people there uh, buy more and more generators. It's our mission to replace uh, all of these by clean energy solutions. Thanks very much. Yeah, Georg uh, Lipchi, uh, Lipich, excuse me, from Okra Solar. Um, over to you to introduce yourself and tell us about you and Okra cool. Solar. Yeah, um, thanks everyone. Thanks for the introduction and for having me at this webinar. Uh, actually, I'm really excited about this because uh, the Cicada library is, is kind of my baby since I joined Okra Solar in uh, 2019. Um, I was the first and the main developer in this library, and it's a good opportunity to present it here. So let me quickly tell what Okra actually does. It uh, creates power mesh grids in very remote areas where people currently don't have access to electricity. So our main markets are in uh, currently in Nigeria and in Southeast Asia. We have uh, customers in Cambodia, in the Philippines, and in the Indonesia, for example. And uh, basically how it works, the principle is quite simple. Basically, we get the solar panel on the roof. Um, you have that central solar charger. Uh, you have a battery which is charged. And all the households are also interconnected with a so-called mesh. Basically, they can share the power. If one house has more battery power than the other one, or if one house uh, has, uh, for example, someone is watching TV and needs to consume more power, then this can be shared between the houses. This is called a mesh grid. And we developed this solar controller ourselves. Uh, this is an IoT device which not only charges the battery and shares the power, but also um, communicates um, all the data it um, processes, uh, it communicates it to the cloud. And this is where we internally use Cicada. So we have uh, Cicada hardware, which are basically different versions of communication modules. And we have the Cicada library, which actually does all the low level communication with the modules. Great, thank you for that. Um, so we already have heard a bit about what the Cicada IO2 module or modules actually are um, by this intro and uh, what we said so far. So let us go into a bit more of details to lead over to the discussion that I'm really looking forward to. Um, the Cicada Wi-Fi GSM and LTE modules. So you see these are different modules. Um, IoT communication modules, as it already says, um, which enable energy access assets, as um, Rainier just said, for example, or Georg said, to communicate uh, with the cloud or um, and send the data to, to a backend, which then can be processed by each company. And this is something that in the sector pretty much any company needs to do or is already doing or needs to do. Um, and we, as Energy X, as an Access Foundation, saw the great potential of this is a piece of work which is really essential to the operations of pretty much every Energy Access actor. Um, and having this part open source, shared, and by supported and further developed by a community is a, is a great potential because we don't need to spend each of us doing this basic required, required technology at our own. We need a, a working solution that can then be adapted and adopted to, to each particular case for, for each company. And that's why we believe that the open source power at this particular part. 
and particularly looking into the transition from 2G networks to 4G networks, so they're not longer supported 2G networks, which in some countries are already shut down, and in the others they're under process too, and the others are coming soon. Um, so uh, an easy change from a 2G to a 4G module by having actually open libraries and an open documentation would facilitate much more this transition. And that's the potential that an XSR uh, years back when we engaged to support this project. So I would now hand over to Georg again to provide us a bit more of technical details um, on the Cicada modules and would then come in with some questions uh, between me and Pioneer that we have about this great project and to understand it better and to make it uh, more understood by the wider audience that we have here today. Uh, yeah, cool. Let me probably quickly start uh, with the history, how it was all developed. Um, so basically, we started developing it at Okra um, to fulfill our own needs. So we had this IoT device, and we, uh, when we originally started, they were all connected with 2G. Um, but we already knew that 2G will not be the final solution, so we probably will uh, switch over to 4G in future, of course. And we also want to support Wi-Fi. And we also uh, want to uh, probably even support like other protocols, like what we're currently working on sub gigahertz, or there are a bunch of other IoT protocols. And the question was, is there a, a, like a way, ecosystems where we can easily exchange all those modules without having uh, to change too much um, on our main firmware and also, of course, at, at the hardware? And uh, yeah, we did, we did some research as usually, but uh, surprisingly it turned out that there were not too many libraries fulfilling that needs. There are of, of course some, there's for example, uh, the, all the Android, um, uh, not Android, sorry, the Arduino ecosystem has some uh, ways to support these models and uh, embed has some things, but they are also rather new. They didn't exist in that way when we started with Cicada. Um, but yeah, surprisingly it turned out that there are not so many options uh, available. So we thought uh, of developing them ourselves. And at the same time, um, we got in contact with NXS, uh, who were actually happy to sponsor this as an open source project. And this is what we started. So we started basically with 4G and 2G support. Uh, later, we added Wi-Fi. And currently, uh, this is very early stage of development, but currently we are working on uh, Wi-Sun and LoRaWAN support. Um, yeah, probably a bit to the library itself. So it's um, a C++ um, embedded library, which does not um, depend on many external libraries, basically just uh, the standard C++ library, um, but otherwise no uh, external dependencies. Uh, it's designed very modular with um, basically a clear separation between interfaces and actual implementation of the interfaces. So, for example, when you want to add the new modem driver, you would basically implement the interface of the COM device um, to support your new device. Great. Thank you, Georg, for, for this intro. Um, I think very insightful. Um, I have one question to start with if now uh, i'm using 2g uh, cicada what would it take me to change to 4g so what is the because in the country i'm operating yeah. the operators take down the 2g support and i need to change to the 4g what is the work i mean if you can shortly describe what is the kind of work and how much mm -hmm. time and effort it would take yeah, I mean, of course, it depends not only on 2G or 4G, but also on the vendor of the modems you use. Um, but if you use the Cicada library, it, uh, ideally it wouldn't involve any work at all. So you have to uh, chuck on a different module onto your device. Um, but the library also has an auto detect feature. So it will just detect that there is not a 2G module collected anymore, but instead a 4G module. Um, actually, I will demonstrate this uh, later in the live demo. And um, yeah, if you have uh, used it with Cicada and already used uh, Cicada's auto detector, then you wouldn't have to do anything. It just detects a different device. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rainier, do you have any question? Otherwise, I go on, but uh, I want to give the stage to you. Yeah, actually, I thought it might be interesting to sketch our use case and why we got interested in uh, Cicada in the first place. Um, because we are using in our MCU a uh, Nordic chip, 
Uh, it runs an operating system uh, which is Minute from Apache, um, which is not supported uh, so far by Cicada. Um, the chip that we have uh, communicates with the cloud uh, through uh, Bluetooth low energy. So you, we have an app that goes with it and the user um, uh, connects with this Android app uh, to the system. And then we kind of uh, utilize the data bundle of the user to transfer our data. It's a nice low cost solution. I mean, it has, doesn't have monthly costs. That's a big advantage. But um, for us, the data volume and the, the frequency of the connections that we get depends on the behavior of the customer in the end. And now we have a new use case, which is to electrify uh, health centers. And for that, we need live data. So uh, we want this data regardless if the customer connects with the smartphone to the system or not. That's why we are planning on extending uh, our systems with uh, 4G modem or possibly also 2G for low cost, but then we run in the same problem that uh, Georg already described that it's phased out in some countries. And uh, we started to look around actually, actually the same as uh, Okra did back then for an open source driver. And there are not so many that are available that are good. Most are incomplete or badly written, or maybe they're already tied into some other IoT ecosystem. And um, Cicada quickly identified as the best candidate, especially because it's not tied into anything. It's open source. It, uh, it's, it seems very well written and modular. So that's really nice. And uh, it always has support also for 4G, but you can swap out with two. Um, for us, though, there are some challenges because we uh, need to uh, include the library. We will size up to a bigger chip to have more flash memory available, but probably we would have to do that anyway. Um, a more practical problem is that our code is in C, so we need to uh, glue in this uh, C++ code from the uh, Cicada library. So there's some work there to um, kind of embed it in our uh, compilation process and uh, probably compile it as a static library first, which um, is then tied into our uh, C code. But otherwise, it looks very uh, solid. Like I said, uh, the, the code is clearly tested, there's unit tests available, etc. And um, yeah, we are uh, happy that uh, Cicada is existing and we don't have to reinvent the wheels. So that's exactly what your purpose was. Um, question to you, Georg. Um, we found the project on GitHub. Um, is that project actively supported? Can we ask questions there, uh, file bug reports, and maybe even if we uh, extend the library, also do merge requests to get our own code included in the library uh yeah sure um well actually the cicada library is actively developed um by us still um we at okra we currently have two people working on it of course it's not our only project it's just part of our project um but how it internally works we develop it internally then we push it to the okra github um, page uh, and then it usually goes to nxs um, but yeah, it's definitely, um, there are definitely people maintaining it. So if you create a merge request or if you um, open an issue tracker, we are definitely happy to work on that. And of course, merge requests are always welcome. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I imagine <laughs> with open source projects. So raising yeah. an issue is one thing and making a merge request is obviously more welcome. Um, so yeah, to the, to the, developer community out there and um, feel invited to contribute. This is exactly what we are looking for. And we hope this mm -hmm. uh, webinar contributes to that and helps to understand um, the potential of the project and later with the demo also how to get started. Um, to to add uh, one, one question to, to Rainier, what of the CCAR, I mean, you, you already mentioned a few things that it's well documented and so on. Um, are there any other particularities that you found special about this um, like library or, or list documentation of the IoT module, which makes it more outstanding from the others? 
Um, like I said, very well organized, very complete. Um, what's also interesting is that the communication with the modem is non-blocking. So that seems a nice feature for us to use with our operating system. Uh, maybe Georg, you can comment a bit more on the philosophy, what you had with uh, um, communicating the modem. Yeah, the non-blocking non uh, philosophy. So it's um, this is a principle in programming. When you do communication with some external devices, you can either implement it blocking or non-blocking. Blocking, you basically mean um, you ask for something. For example, you ask the modem for new data. Then you just wait until the data is here. This is blocking. And non-blocking means you basically ask for the modem. Then you go on, can do other things in between. Uh, and as soon as you receive those new data, you, you process them. And uh, usually non-blocking approach um, is um, a bit more difficult to understand. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit more work to implement, especially on the driver side. Um, but it has the advantage that's usually uh, in the code. It's a very linear program flow you have. You don't interrupt uh, your functions by any other threads. And it's usually easier to debug if you have any any problems. And our approach there was to make it a very strict non-blocking design, um, which means um, basically all the driver levels are designed as uh, non-blocking state machines. And you, it's in microcontroller programming, this is a common pattern. You basically have a big loop, uh, which uh, just loops around and calls the processing function again and again. And whenever there is something to do, the processing uh, function gets active, uh, probably changes its internal state, and then returns back to the main event loop. And yeah, this is uh, uh, internally, um, we discovered that for some um, uh, engineers, especially those uh, who are not so familiar with uh, embedded development, found it a bit difficult to understand this non-blocking design. But actually, uh, for microcontroller development, it's quite a common pattern. Okay, Rainier, do you have any questions? Otherwise, I would come in with a question, which is completely another scope, so if it's more technical. Yeah, you, you can go ahead, please. Okay, then um, do you... I mean, you were mentioning um, like merges and contributions to your project. Have you actually, Georg, that's a question to you. Um, have you gotten like requests for like collaboration or contributions to your uh, repository so far? Or do you know of others um, already using the Cicada so, module? So far, it's not too many actually. There's um, one, uh, actually, I don't. Uh, remember the name, but there is a uh, one um, organization also in Germany, I think, which creates open source um, solar charge, uh, also open source uh, solar controllers, uh, and uh, they have explored and looked into the library. Um, I think they also contributed some small MRs, but from I didn't hear them back since a while. Um, yeah, other than that, it's mainly internal. So also internally, we have this process that every change which is made um, is made by someone, then it goes through a review and then an R and then it's internally merged. So the process okay. is common to us, but the contributors are mainly internal. So far. Okay, thank you. And um, following up on that, I mean, as at least the ones here in the room and looking at the quite high number of attendees, I believe it's a topic that is really relevant and important for the sector. And I mean, it's also what we identified the time back also by talking to other stakeholders in the sector. What do you believe is the reason that not so many, and this is a question to both of you, to Einir and, and Georg, um, if you have any idea, what is the reason why, why you don't know about too many users? Do you think it's there are a lot of users and because it's open, it's open source, you just don't know it? Or do you believe actually, because when it's open source, whoever could come and just take it and use it without asking you anything or without contributing? Um, or do you believe there's another reason, um, even though we all agree on the relevance and looking at, as I said, and the number of attendees we have here, it's relevant. Um, yeah, do you have any ideas what could be a, a blocker so far or what could be reasons? And that's a very open question. Yeah, that's a, 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 it's a good question, actually. Uh, I mean, the first thing is that we actually don't know. It could be that there are many more users from which we never heard of. Um, 
but it could also be that there are not too many. I don't really know that. Um, I mean, that's the nature of open source that you can just take it and don't really have to tell anyone about it. Um, one other reason could be that this a C++ library. I think Ryan here, you mentioned it before. That's actually uh, interesting because when, when we started with Cicada, also our internal um, firmware code is written in C++ and we kind of wanted to fill the gap that there are not so many uh, C++ projects out there. So we made it C++, um, but it turned out that actually most of the firmware developers still use plain C, so this could be a thing. Um, yeah, the just uh, the strictly non-blocking device um, approach could be another thing. So I just, uh, when preparing for this webinar, I wrote a new uh, example code, which um, does, um, does not use some of the internal Cicada macros and things um, we usually introduced, um, which are a bit, bit uncommon. So hopefully this will make it a bit more clear how to use it. And uh, yeah, of course, we hope that with this uh, webinar, it also spreads the word. But yeah, we, we don't know, probably just uh, more people will use it and not tell us, can, can never know. Yeah, Rainier, right. anything to add on that one? Any idea? As you are somebody who is actually looking into using it, so uh, maybe yeah. what could be blockers? You should not forget there's also commercial solutions out there and they are not per se expensive, but often they tie you into some ecosystem where you have to use their cloud also. I saw, for instance, also now that Amazon has their own, um, or I mean, not their own, but offers hardware that can directly connect to their cloud. So if you're using that, um, uh, yeah, you don't need to develop it yourself. Um, could be that some companies don't have the time or expertise to develop this fully by themselves and they get some ready modules. Uh, there's also some modules you can buy that uh, you just push data into it and it sends everything um, to your backend so you don't have to do much development yourself. Of course, the disadvantage is these are black boxes that you are then uh, using. You don't have control over what they do exactly. Uh, it would be harder to debug if you get any problems and uh, yeah, you, you don't have the, the source code, you can't modify it for your own purposes. Those were for us really important points to uh, choose Cicada. But it might be that, um, yeah, some uh, people don't have the development capacity or the time to, to do this all. Or even if it's a ready-made library, it's of course some work to include it in your own um, firmware and your uh, wider ecosystem of your connection to the to the cloud or to your back end, whatever. Okay, um, thank you. And I think it's a, a great uh, hand over to actually the demonstration by Georg so that people who actually want to get started and to have some capacity or maybe limited capacity and need some help on how to actually use um, the, the Cicada module um can now get a demo by georg how to get started uh with it so stage is your georg we will leave you alone and uh you have some 20 minutes to show to the attendees of this uh, webinar on how to start using cicada awesome yeah thanks everyone so the second part of this webinar will be much more technical than the first one so i will um basically do a hands-on. I will first show you um, some of the Cicada modules and some of the hardware uh, I have available. Uh, then I will uh, start a live demonstration running it uh, on a, a STM Nucleo microcontroller and um, forwarding the output uh, to the computer. And then I will actually um, do a code walkthrough through this example code um, that I just showed before. And I just fall down. I have this uh, Cicada modules here. I just uh, show them into the camera. So this is basically the Wi-Fi module uh, based on the Espressif A266 um, microcontroller. Uh, then we have a 2G cellular module here. Um, this is based on the uh, quite popular SIM 800 module. Uh, and then there is this uh, 
4G module. Uh, it's based on the SIM 7600 module. And uh, yeah, these um, small PCBs I just showed, they are also published in GitHub and uh, available as uh, open source hardware. Um, so the hardware is actually um, rather simple. So it's basically just this module on a PCP with a power supply and uh, some antenna networks, depending on the on the module you use. So this is um, rather simple, but it's still very useful to use as a reference design. And uh, basically, you can just you probably don't want to use the modules exactly as they are if you build a product, but it's still a very good reference. You can just copy and paste um, the hardware design into your own design and use that one. So basically the, the Wi-Fi module is just a power supply and the expressive modules, the 2G and 4G models are a bit more sophisticated. They also have uh, an um, antenna network. They have obviously the SIM card reader. And what's also important there is to have a very stable power supply because one of the problems we had is there are some pre-made models you can order on AliExpress or whatever, but the power supplies on them were actually too weak to support the current spikes the model used. So we had to create our own power supplies. So um, let me quickly show one more thing. This is basically um, at Okra. This is the main board of our solar controllers. And uh, whenever you want, um, to change your mo uh, communications modules, it just plugs in here. And yeah, basically just a plug and play solution. So when uh, everyone want uh, to use it with a different module, um, we just chip the main board with a different module installed and we don't have to change anything at our firmware. So it's just uh, the same code to transfer all of them. Um, yeah, that was the little that was a little introduction to the hardware. And uh, the next thing is um, I will actually start with the Fife demonstration. Let me again first show the hardware. So I have a little um, STM Nuclear developer board here. So you can see uh, the microcontrollers over here, this chip. And this has currently uh, connected to um, modules. In that case, I don't use the um, Cicada PCBs. I just connected the modules directly with these wires over here. It has a Wi-Fi modem, which you see on the top here. And uh, with these wires here, it has again a SIM 800 module connected to it. And uh, yeah, now you've seen the hardware. I will um, start sharing my screen and show you some code. Um, just need to select the right screen over here. Chromium. Okay, yeah, you should now be able to see uh, my VS code with the uh, example code. And uh, yeah, so this, um, this around uh, 200 lines file is basically um, the example I will walk you through now. Uh, on a high level, what it does basically is in, it initializes all the drivers. Um, then it detects the modem with that modem detector. Um, then it connects to a web server, sends a HTTP request, um, receive the, receives the website from a web server and actually forwards it, forwards it from the microcontroller to the terminal on, on my computer so that we can see the website. Um, let me quickly check which is enabled. So we will um, first start with the Wi-Fi module. Um, so here you ha I have two terminals. Um, one is um, for flashing and compiling code. And here you actually have the serial UART part, um, which gives the output from the, which displays the output from the microcontroller. And we start with compiling. We use uh, Nason and Ninja. Uh, as, as the build system, and then we actually flash. Now writes the binary to the microcontroller. And uh, yeah, now you see here on the output, 
that it actually detected the expressive model. Uh, it's happening faster than I can talk. So it detected the expressive Wi-Fi module. Then it connected to the web server, uh, receives the HTTP header, and yeah. finally yeah. fetches this weather report from the website. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but we still see in your code. We don't see the live demo screen. Oh, that's very weird, actually. Uh, um, okay, I saw this, share my screen. Okay, just give me a second. Some the screen. Uh, okay, sorry for that. Um, probably just shared uh, just one window um, instead of sharing my screen. Yeah. So we just could have seen. But yeah, here it's basically. Um, I quickly repeat what I did. So I called Ninja, which compiles the code. Then I flashed it to the microcontroller, and this is the output from everything um, where it detects. It says detect the expressive Wi-Fi module. Uh, then it connected, and then it fetches this weather report from the website. Um, but yeah, any, I wanted to show it again anyway, because I want to do the same procedure now with uh, Tucci module. Um, so as I said before, I have two modules connected to this. It's just uh, another module on another UART board. So I comment out this part of the code, and instead I comment in this part of the code. So it's the same uh, object which is created, just with different uh, pins, with a different UART port and different pins with the other module connected. So we do the same thing again. File, flash. Now I see it live, what I just did before. And if I change terminal now, you see that it actually detects the 2G, the 2G, um, 4G modem, it says 2G, 4G because it's uh, um, actually the different drivers, but they, uh, they inherit one base instance. So we can just use the SIMCOM driver in this case. And again, it fetches the weather report from the website. So um, yeah, this was the, the live demonstration. And now I uh, probably use around 10 more minutes to walk you through that code so yeah now you should be able to see uh, the VS code again um, so this is um, everything is happening in the main function over here you have basically some uh, in initializations you have um, the cicada um, the buffer in, in initializations for all the drivers um, so basically in cicada all buffers are user supplied uh, this is useful because there are different ways how you want um, to actually initialize your buffer. It could be on the heap, it could be in the stack, it could be on uh, on a local function stack, or it could be a global um, stack, whatever. So you just create your buffer wherever you want to create it. And then when you actually create one of the driver objects, you will hand in uh, that user created buffers over here. So these lines actually create the, this, um, there's also serial drivers included in the library. In this case, we use the STM32 serial driver. Um, we also create, ser we create the serial driver for the debug UART, which um, we just used um, to connect to the PC. Um, then we create a serial uh, driver here for the specific modules. And then we actually start creating the modem detector object, um, which, uh, which has this auto detect feature. So the, how the detector basically works is um, you create this uh, modem detector objects, um, then you run, um, you add it to the uh, Cicada internal task handler. And um, then you have to go to the main loop and call its uh, run method, which we do here. And um, basically what the modem detector does, uh, does is it uh, tries to send 8T comments to the modem to figure out which module is installed. And then it gives you back the uh, correct C++ driver object of that specific modem you want to use. So 
um, that basically happens here. Um, you um, first you start the detector, then you go to the main loop. Um, and uh, as soon as you have this flex set modem detected, you basically actually assign your COM device um, to the actual modem driver object, which happened here. And then you can basically um, figure out which device you actually got. Um, a common way to do this in C++ is with a dynamic cast. So you try to cast it to a SIMCOM device, which is for these 2G or 4G modems. If you have a SIMCOM device, you still have to set the APN, which we do here. Um, if, if it's not the 2G or 4G modem, uh, this um, dynamic cast will just return zero uh, and uh, the function goes on. And uh, the same thing we do for Wi-Fi. If it's a Wi-Fi module, we set some uh, username and password. So this uh, password is actually the one of our co-working space. It's not uh, committed to GitHub. Um, and yeah, depending on if you have some other models, you can do other casts. For example, you can cast to a 2G modem, to a 4G modem or whatever. And for this way, you can determine which model you actually have. Uh, this is again uh, generic, which is valid for all uh, the communication devices. You set host and uh, port, and then you can actually call connect. Um, so the next event uh, here in this main loop is the actual uh, connection up. So if as soon as the modem is connected, um, you will have the com device is connected method returning true. Um, within this method, um, what we uh, do here is uh, we, yeah, we print obviously the line to the debug UR, and then we actually uh, build up the HTTP header, which we write to the COM device. Um, and then we set this flag to true because we don't want to call this event ever again. Um, and the next event is um, the actual receive event. So you have another method, um, com device by its available, which basically tells you um, that there is new data and how much new data. Um, so this is called whenever there's data available. And what it basically does is it just reads the data from the com device and forwards it to the debug UR so we can see it on the computer's uh, modem screen. And uh, at the end, finally, so basically, um, as you see here, we have uh, set the connection close flag in the HTTP header. So the um, remote host closes the connection as soon as it um, has sent all the data from the website. And uh, this is basically the close event. So once um, the communication device is again back to idle state, we just um, print it. Uh, debug message that we disconnected and we exit the main event loop. Um, so this was uh, pretty much all you have to do for this example um, to detect the modem and fetch the website. Um, probably some more words to this um, event loop. So how it basically works, um, this is a, I think quite a common pattern in microcontroller development. You basically have just one big main loop, which uh, just runs um, over and over again. And within this main loop, you call uh, different, um, uh, you call different um, task methods and handle your events. So um, for Cicada, we have an internal task scheduler. It's a very simple scheduler. It's not, not like what you know from um, high-end operating system schedules, it basically just checks if um, all the tasks in the list uh, are due to run. And if, it, if it's due to run, meaning it has a certain timeout, then actually it runs the task. So basically what you have to do is you have to create a Cicada scheduler. You have to add um, your tasks to the task list, which in our case is just a modem detector. Um, and then within a main loop of your microcontroller, you call um, this um, Cicada task scheduler uh, run task method. Um, you have to call it repeatedly. Um, yeah, that's basically how this works. Um, 
I can quickly show you how uh, an internal driver works. For example, if I open the SIM 800, um, the TPP driver, um, this is also a, only 400 lines um, source code file, which is um, the implementation of the full SIM 800 driver. And basically this run method is um, what I showed before has to uh, be called periodically from the main event loop. And all the internal tasks in Cicada, uh, mainly the drivers, um, but also like the detector, uh, the serial driver, whatever, all those are implemented as, uh, inter as state machines internally. So it basically means, um, uh, for example, here you have the uh, main uh, state machine for sending out the comment. Um, oh no, sorry, this is um, this was for receiving re uh, replies. So this is the state machine for actually sending the AT comments. So you have different states. You are first not connected, then you handle your states. You usually send a bunch of AT comments, uh, and then you go to your next state. So, for example, here you send first a comment to not um, reply, to not echo the characters which go to the modem. Then you go to the next state. Then you send a bunch of configuration for these modems. In this uh, case, it's the um, how it um, the active or passive mode basically for the flow control of the modem, um, and then you actually uh, set APN. Um, then you actually uh, set up your connection, uh, which is over here first the cellular connection, then the um, actual TCP or UDP connection, and then um, you finally are in the connected state, which which is actually for handling um, incoming and outgoing data. Yeah, there are different states also for actually processing the data, and in the end you basically just have to disconnect and finalize states again. Um, yeah, that was a quick, quick introduction how a modem driver looks like. Um, let me probably finally go back to the main example. So I already went through the main loop. Um, and everything that comes after is just boilerplate code to initialize your uh, main MCU. This is just copied from this. Um, there's this um, program where you can get bo create boilerplate codes for STM32 microcontrollers. Uh, CubeMX is the name. So this is just auto generated with CubeMX. And uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Um, let me quickly check in the chat. Okay, I see that there is a bunch of questions in the chat. So I think it's a good opportunity to end this uh, demonstration code, code walkthrough. And yeah, let's finally hand back to uh, Vivian and go to the discussion. Yes, thank you, Georg, for, for this um, great uh, intro and demo for anybody interested in using uh, Cicada modules and how to get started. Um, I think very helpful. Um, we have a few questions which I would like to address here, um, by, which came into the chat. Also, others who want to make questions still, you have still some time, some 10 minutes to post them in the chat and we will address them as good as we can in, in the time that we have remaining. Um, if not, if you're not able to manage it here, we will make sure to try to reach out to get you the answers, but uh, let's get moving. Um, the first one uh, is about general IoT cost. I mean, we, we all now am making a asset IoT enabled um, costs money. And here the question is written as if the current IoT will increase the price of the whole product a lot, uh, it is a big challenge for the end users. Yes. What are the most useful points of IoT module? Um, maybe very quick one. 
who of you two, because you're both using IoT uh, or looking into, um, who wants to take it? Maybe Georg, I give it over to you. Um, yeah, let me read the question again. Um, if the current IoT, you mean if the IoT will increase in prices? Um, yeah, I think um, it's difficult to tell, of course, how prices will uh, develop on the market. Um, but actually, our experience is that the uh, um, models got cheaper. They rather uh, decrease in price than they increase in price, especially this. Um, if they, if you use a, a SIM 800 module, which is already like 2G is quite outdated, but you can get them for, I think, around a dollar or something in high volumes. Um, but yeah, I think the, the most useful um, idea of the Cicada library is also that these IoT modules, the communication modules specifically, are exchangeable. So for example, if one goes up in price, you could switch to another vendor, you could switch to a, um, another module from the same vendor, or you can just implement your own or whatever you think, and you still have a flexible ecosystems, which makes it easier to interchange um, your supply chain if prices change. Great, thank you. Uh, let me just quickly add on that one. I mean, um, A2EI with their solar generator, it's a, it's a rather costly um, product. Let's say, I mean, it's not costly compared to the market, but if you talk about a small solar light, you will probably not make an IoT Cicada module on it because it doubles or triples the price of the product. And there you would possibly use the Bluetooth solution, which Rainier was mentioning earlier. And just to mention here, at an access, we have an open source solution for that as, as well, which is the Airlink. So uh, go on our homepage, check out Airlink. If you want to, if you don't need real time data and can rely on an agent coming or a customer coming with a smartphone from time to time near your asset and it's a small asset, then you can rely on a Bluetooth communication and the, the smartphone would actually act as a data carrier. Um, and yeah, we have another open source solution for that. And then you don't have to go full, full IoT real time data, which makes it obviously more costly. I hope this question was answered well enough. And I would move to the next one, which I believe already has been answered mainly. Um, the question posed by Patrick, is the GitHub project available as C implementation or only C++? I mean, yeah. this is an issue. Yeah, we have raised. talked about that before. So basically, Cicada library is fully C++. It does not yet have any plain C code. So if you want to use it in your C project, you have to mix C and C++. There are good online tutorials about how to do that. Um, the, the, yeah, probably not going into detail too much now, but the simplest way is just to use a C++ compiler. Um, if you cannot do that, and if you want to strictly separate C and C++ code, you have to write C wrappers around your C++ methods, which is a bit more work. Um, but yeah, if anyone is um, probably going to contribute a C wrapper for the C++ codes, that would be very welcome because then we support both. Yeah, that's exactly what we plan to do, actually. We can't use a C++ compiler, so we will write a wrapping code, and we hope to uh, add it as a contribution to Cicada project, so that there's an example. There. Awesome. That, that would be awesome. Yeah, great. Patrick, maybe reach out to Rainier as well, if you, if you want to work together on that. Um, I mean, that's what is open source, and that's what we want to see. Uh, let's move to the next question quickly from Jeff. Um, and let's try to make the answers as uh, short as possible. How many different types of modems and chips does Cicada support? Um, yeah, I think we have a list on the readme. I'm not sure if it's up to date, but uh, the main devices are currently SIM 7604G, SIM 802G, Espressive 8266 Wi-Fi, uh, Espress ESP32 Wi-Fi, um, and uh, we currently working on, I think this is not yet publicly released, but we are also um, working on support for LoRaWAN. Um, there is uh, a Ch Chinese LoRaWAN manufacturer, um, which provides 80 modules, which we support. And uh, we, we will support Wysun um, 
Texas Instruments CC8256, I think, uh, was an uh, SOC from Texas Instruments. Great. Um, thanks, Georg. I hope your question has been properly answered, Jeff. Um, next question from Martin. Um, are you planning to support Sapphire Ertos in the future? Uh, embed operating system seems almost dead as ARM has kind of abandoned it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I want to repeat this again. Sorry if it wasn't clear before. So actually, the Cicada library itself is uh, completely independent of the operating systems. It's even possible to use it as bare metal library. So you don't have to use any operating system at all. And if you want, I think there are some example codes in the Cicada library on how to use it with embed. If for some reason you want to use it um, with in combination with embed threads or something, for example, um, like I showed in my demonstration, I had the simple event loop where I do everything. But another way would be you could, for example, call the uh, periodic run method from one thread and actually call the actual um, driver methods from another thread, but then you have to synchronize them. So this is all possible. Um, and But again, it does not depend what operating system you use. Cicada itself is uh, not dependent on an operating system, but you can use it together with one. Great, thanks. Um, then another question from Martin. It's actually, as far as I see, Martin from LibreSolar, the one that you mentioned uh, earlier, Georg, as a interested or an adopter of uh, the Cicada modules and oh, yeah. also developer yeah, of the open source battery management system supported by NXS. And so we have here the great open source community live. Um, question is, um, the question is regarding the event loop. Is it possible for the MCU to go into low power sleep mode while waiting for the new input? And I would request you to answer as quick as possible as we have one more question, which I would like to address and then close the session. Okay, that's a good, that's a bit tricky question, actually, to be honest. Um, it's not supported by the Cicada library itself because this, the drivers don't support any energy mode. So you basically would have, um, I think what you would have to do is just to go into sleep. You have to wake up your event loop uh, with an interrupt as soon as you have data from the UART. So you can go to sleep, but you just would have to wake up your main event loop um, from the as soon as your data arrives. Then you process the data, and then you go to sleep again. But that's not part of the Cicada. That's part of your operating system. OK, thanks. I, I hope this was uh, enough for you, Martin. Um, but yeah, you know how to find Georg and uh, can follow up if you have more questions. And the uh, last question from Akshat. Um, Sorry if I didn't pronounce your name well. Uh, is it a good idea to integrate LoRa modules? If yes, no, some explanation. Uh, one minute to answer this question. Yeah, sure. um, was a bit tricky question. I think um, what you basically, um, why you're asking this question is because LoRa one, the approach of LoRa is very different than normal IP communications. So you don't have IP addresses. You don't, you can't simply connect an internet host. Um, so yeah, I think the, even though we have this Cicada ecosystem, using a LoRaWAN module would be uh, would be quite different than using a normal internet module. So, um, but yeah, anyways, there already is a LoRaWAN driver working process. It is not very well tested, but it's uh, almost complete. And uh, yeah, I think how actually useful it is to use Cicada in that case, that really depends on the use case. That's very difficult to answer now. Yeah, thank you, Georg. And um, you did a great job answering all these questions and uh, all the triggers. Thank you, Rainier, for being here and uh, sharing your interest uh, for this Cicada module and uh, the value you see on it. Um, we want to close the session with uh, pointing out NXIS does open source, promotes open source, but also helps adopting open source. So if you need help in adopting, reach out to us. We try to help you as much as we can. We can't promise that we solve all problems for you, but we do, we'll do our best. So help at nexus.org. If you want to reach out for funding or any other question on us, info at nexus.org. If you want to reach out to Okra Solar, Georg, the developer of the Cicada modules, info at okrasolar.com. And if you want to 
contact us A2EI, info at A2EI.org. Thank you for attending today uh, and thank you for this great and engaging discussion to Georg and Rainier and to all the attendees that joined us here today. Bye-bye and see you soon. Bye.